Right, good morning. I'm Julie Mayo. I'm a partner in the Houston office of Baker Botts and a member of the Global Projects team. I'm so pleased to be the moderator of our final panel of this Energy Summit. During this panel, we will attempt to tie everything that we've heard yesterday and this morning together as we evaluate how the energy transition is manifesting itself globally, how the drivers, challenges, and opportunities vary between regions, and what the state of international cooperation is at the moment in anticipation of COP26 in Glasgow, which begins almost exactly a month from today. So much has changed since COP21, where the Paris Agreement was born and the international community agreed to work together toward the lofty but necessary goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial levels. Of course, in some ways, very little has changed as well. As we heard yesterday, we still have a very long way to go to achieve that goal, as well as some of the other goals of the Paris Agreement, and the window for doing so is closing. I know many in this room are eagerly awaiting the updated national plans set to be presented next, next month at COP26. In addition to providing a forum for nations to present their updated plans, COP26 will bring together critical voices in the energy transition in what some are calling the last opportunity to push for real climate action in order to meet a number of shared global objectives. During his keynote yesterday, Mr. Satomori posited that a well-managed energy transition should be a solution for energy inequities, not a cause of them. We will further explore this point as we discuss the allocation of the burdens and costs associated with the energy transition, as well as what regions stand to reap its benefits. For many of us who perhaps haven't traveled extensively in quite some time, this panel will hopefully be particularly exciting because we will be taking a little trip around the world. Starting in China and working our way back west to the US as we take a truly global view of the energy transition and its more regional and local impacts from our panelists who are each actively involved with energy transition considerations in these areas and are familiar with the competing challenges each region faces and the different opportunities presented by the transition and the opportunity for global collaboration on these issues. So you didn't come to hear me. I'd like to introduce our panelists very briefly. I'll do it in the order in which they will present, um, but their full biographies are available in the materials that you've received. So first we're joined by Gabe Collins, Gabe is the Baker Botts Fellow in Energy and Environmental Regulatory Affairs here at the Baker Institute. He is a recovering lawyer and co-founder of the China Signpost Portal, which provides analysis on commodities in China. Next, we will hear from Atanu Mukherjee, the Chief Executive Officer, Officer of Daster Energy, an Austin-based energy engineering and consulting firm focused on low carbon energy strategies. Todd Moss, who you should see behind us as he joins virtually, is the founder and executive director of the Energy for Growth Hub, as well as serving as a non-resident fellow here at the Center for Energy Studies. Todd previously served as US Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. As we move into the Americas, we will hear from Tomas Gonzalez. Tomas is the director of the Regional Center for Energy Studies, which is focused on energy policy in Colombia and previously served as Colombia's energy minister. Last but certainly not least, we will end our presentations with Nicole Gibson, who currently serves as the deputy director for Europe, Eurasia, and Central Asia in the Office of Europe, Western Hemisphere, and Africa at the US Department of State. So I think we'll get right into it. Gabe, would you like to kick us off? Thank you. So thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to Baker Botts for helping us put on such a wonderful event. And I'm glad that we're taking this tour virtually, because I think as you'll see from the title of what I'm about to speak about, some of the work that precedes it, I probably wouldn't be allowed into China these days. So, you know, good that, yeah. good that we have the virtual option. Uh, next slide, please. So there's the lawyer disclaimer here. The, uh, the real disclaimer is I'm going to be flying at 50 to 60,000 feet. There will inevitably be some things I oversimplify. There'll probably be some things I miss. I would strongly encourage all of you in the audience and, you know, 
y'all as well to uh, hammer me during the Q&A if I do that. My skin is thick, I'm a Permian Basin guy, so you know, by all means. Uh, next slide, please. So normally you'd start a climate discussion by having a slide perhaps that shows quantities of CO2 emissions, energy use, things like that. I didn't do that because I think especially insofar as China di uh, uh, climate diplomacy between China and the United States is concerned, we're frankly not in normal times. We're in what I think is, can, is very defensively considered the opening stages of a Cold War between the U.S. and China. It's really an unprecedented challenge because not only do we have the world's two biggest energy users and two biggest carbon emitters, but you have a situation where what would already be a fiendishly difficult collection action problem now has layered on top of that really intense strategic competition. And the party that we would be negotiating with has already made it very clear that climate will not be handled as a standalone issue despite uh, our present administration's desire to do so. It's gonna be linked to specific issues, but also the bilateral relationship as a whole. And you know, this comes from the highest levels in China. This is from Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who would be the uh, equivalent of Secretary of State Blinken on, on this side of the Pacific. And one of the things I think here, you, you know, in, in, in instances where somebody comes out and says such specific things on such an important issue, at least my inclination is you generally want to take them at their word. They've made very clear that the U.S. positions on Taiwan, on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and, and I think unspoken here, there'd be a number of other issues as well, are going to be very closely linked to climate. And it's also been made very clear just within the past month that for any type of good negotiating progress, there will need to be concessions made, and those concessions will have to come from the U.S. side. And I think just as kind of an indicator of where the state of the world is going, if you look at a 30-year trajectory of defense spending data and you look at the upward trend in the Asia Pacific, which largely driven by China and some of the regional responses to China, and then you look at the black line over the last four to five years, which is our response and our changing views on China, it, it suggests that we're in a world that's very unsettled where this issue is becoming securitized very rapidly. Next slide, please. So now to get away from kind of the doom and gloom there and talk about molecules and volumes for a minute. What I've done here is I broke out global CO2 emissions. I basically, what I call the big five, that'd be China, the United States, India, Russia, and Japan, and then the rest of the world. And what you very quickly see, the US and China alone are about 45%, you know, as of 2020 of global CO2 emissions. And if you're counting the big five collectively, you're approaching 60%. And what I think is very interesting about this trajectory is if you look here, and this is dating back to 1965, the only periods of, I guess, what you could call emissions restraint basically correlate very closely with recessions, or in the case of the very last one in 2020, with a lockdown that you know, shut down economies around the world. And so the upward trend is strong. The world isn't even arguably to peak coal yet, much less peak oil or peak gas. So very formidable set of challenges ahead just on a physics basis. And you can also see just the impacts of China's growth over the last 15 years, the big inflection point between where we went from having the US as the world's largest CO2 emitter to having China in that position. Next slide, please. So one of the big things with this, and you know, I think any lawyer or risk manager here, we know that we can't stamp risk out if we're gonna use risk as our metaphor, but it's always great to lay the burden off on the other side or somebody other than you. And this is something that I think pervades a lot of the climate discussions. And one of the ways that this, these interactions are all, you know, sort of the intellectual frameworks that we use often depend on kind of how do we differentially weight stock as in the amount of carbonaceous fuel we burn to date, the amount we've emitted into the atmosphere versus flows. What are we emitting now and on a go forward basis? And you know, I think it's, you know, there's not consensus. I think if you, if you look at the OECD world, we'd rather look at flows. And if you're looking from a developing world or emerging economies perspective, then stocks are more attractive. The thing with China is it really, it's gotten a point of a level of scale that it really transcends both because 
if you start in 1965 and move forward, China is biggest now both in terms of total emitted stock and of the flow on a go forward basis. And those flows, uh, unlike many of the countries elsewhere in the big five, they're still expanding to this day. Uh, next slide, please. So here, talk versus action. And, and I'll preface this by saying this, there's a little bit of a litigator dig in here at China, but I, I want to be fair to the Chinese position as well and be, you know, very crystal clear with all of you that it's these, th these trajectories here are obvious where for the United States, when we think about transition of fuels in our energy system, it's really fundamentally, at least at a national level, a substitution enterprise. There's maybe one glaring exception to that, and that's the great state that we sit in now, but everywhere else, it's about substitution. China, it's, it's been about growth, and it's likely to continue, you know, absent some type of disaster, being about growth moving forward. And if you just do a simple straight line projection, assuming just 1% growth in electricity generation each year in China and electricity use, you'd be looking at a national portfolio that would need to be about 20% bigger in 2040 than it is today. And so as you undergo, as you undertake energy transition efforts there, you're chasing a moving target. And, and on top of that, you don't have the geological blessing that we have had here with shale gas, because frankly, this slashing of the coal share of the electricity portfolio in the United States really came from a happy coincidence of the shale boom, plus a lot of our coal-fired power fleet reaching its 40th birthday and being amortized and ready to be replaced if uh, fuel prices and, and other pressures made that a, a, a good decision to, to take. Whereas China, it's very different. Coal is their geological bounty, and it's one that they're likely to rely on very heavily, probably more heavily than they'd like to admit for many years moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things to think about here, and I think this is relevant in, not just in China and the United States, but really relevant, you know, particularly in all of the big industrialized economies that we're looking at, is if there are some sort of macro shocks, and I think in this case it'd be a new variety of macro shock, because if it's tied to energy transition efforts, it may be something that is taken more purposefully as opposed to a macro shock, such as an oil price spike that's imposed uh, on an energy consuming system, you know, from an external source. But the bottom line is if you look in the past, you, you look at what happened in the 1970s and 1980s in, in the wake of the oil embargo and instability and price spikes in the oil market is oil and gas use, at least during part of that period, continued to grow. But coal, coal was actually a huge winner. And I think if there were to be disruption events that caused people to change their views and retrench on existing legacy fuels, when we're talking about China, and I think also when we're talking about India, co coal is very logically positioned to take that spot. It's, it's domestically abundant, it's secure, and, and I, I guess at the end of the day, the, the way I like to describe coal is it's basically the McDonald's of energy resources. It's low cost. It's readily available, and, and it's something that keeps you warm and full in the short term, but the problem is it slowly kills you over the long term if you consume too much of it. So maybe not something we want to be overly reliant on, but you know, lest I be accused of any type of hypocrisy for going a little too hard at China, if you look here at what happened to Wyoming's coal production trajectory in the wake of the 1973 oil embargo, it looks like a fighter jet doing a high performance takeoff there until we reach the inflection point in 2008 where more gas comes into the system and we see coal getting pushed out. And so just a, a you know, big historical case example here of how energy sourcing changed in response to a crisis. And you know, what I would add to this is you know we you look at the powder river basin geology in the united states and it's fundamentally replicated in both inner mongolia and xinjiang in china perhaps at an even larger scale and so the, the resource is there if events were to ever uh, trigger that type of turn next slide please and so what i'll do is close here path forward fundamentally climate progress is something that 
deserves a very high degree of attention, but it's something that has to be done right, and the order of operations really matters. And when we're talking about the U.S. and China dealing with each other, coming first, seeking cooperation when the other side's actions and statements alike make it very clear that climate and emissions control are accorded a different and arguably much lower priority in, in their hierarchy of, of political needs and really almost existential survival needs. We have to be very realistic and understand that trying to cooperate first, especially if we have to pay up front with a lot of very concrete concessions, just to get the other side to the table is probably not a sensible policy. Our argument, and we've already made this very strongly in foreign affairs and also through an internal report here at the Baker Institute, is you start with climate competition, you leverage our structural energy advantages here, and I think there's also the difficult step of needing to price carbon more explicitly through a carbon tax here domestically in the United States, try to harmonize this with some of our allies you know, throughout the OECD and perhaps beyond, and use this to generate the leverage and operating space to have a truly productive discussion with China and something that can hopefully deliver real concrete progress rather than the extractive negotiations that I think the PRC would be inclined to pursue today. And with that, I thank you for your time atten and attention and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Gabe. That was great. I, uh, I think it's very interesting and a great example of how sometimes you can see climate policy used as a very strong foreign policy tool. And clearly that's what you're, what you were proposing here. So um, we'll get some questions on that, I'm sure. I'm also a little bit worried about your ability to go to McDonald's now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we'll, we'll move on to India. Yeah. Now. Julie, can I take the podium? Let's Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk about some of the energy perspectives from uh, South Asia. And I think that. Uh, it might be useful to just kind of give a little bit of our background. Uh, you know, I, I run Dustour and Dustour Energy, which is, a, which is a fairly old firm, about 60 years old, and we have been in the business of commodities and, and, and steel and, and building and engineering plants around the world for a long time. Origins from India, but right now, um, we are all over the world, um, and a lot of focus in the area of energy transition. We work on projects on energy transition, um, especially in the carbon capture area for, for different uh, parts of the world, like the United States or UAE or India for that matter. So I think I just want to kind of like uh, talk a little bit about what are some of the perspectives that might be useful to think about, right, from a, pers from, from a South Asian angle. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, so here's, here's something uh, one may want to look at. Um, you know, it, it's about the mental models that we have got, right, and mental models that we form based on where we are, what we see, what we observe, and how things progress. And uh, a couple of tautologies, a couple of principles that we think might be useful to look at and is germane to the developing nations um, as it applies to climate, has got to, do, got to do with the fact that A, we need to understand that CO2 is the enemy, right? Uh, and, uh, and I think the many ways that you can get the CO2 out, right? And it depends on the context of the geography. It depends on many, con many different levers which affect how you're going to get the CO2 out. Uh, it's not about, like I said, it's not about gas or wind or coal um, or oil or solar or nuclear, right? Uh, people generally tend to think about coal as, you know, burning coal to create power. Well, that's one way of doing it. But the other ways coal can be transformed. You can use gasification, for example, with carbon capture to make fairly clean coal-based energy uh, derivatives. Um, similarly, you can look at a combination of different uh, sources to give you a portfolio which gives you the right kind of energy mix at the right CO2 budget. So I think the different levers which drive um, you know, the, the, the energy mix, and I think we should focus on CO2 and equating for example, in generally from a mental model perspective, equating CO2 to renewable CO2 removal to renew renewables is not exactly the way to look at it. You've got to look at the portfolio and look at a bandwagon neutral approach towards how you get to CO2, and especially in the context of developing markets and developing economies where coal 
you know, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big constituent of the energy mix and will continue to be so for quite some time to come. Uh, the, second, the second principle or second what you call uh, aspect that I want to address has got to do with the fact that, you know, electricity is, is a, you know, the CO2 from electricity generation is a problem, certainly, but I don't, that's, on, that's only 30% of the total problem. The 70%, and I think as people have mentioned earlier presentations, 70% are from the hard to abate sectors like industry, transport, and agriculture. Uh, if you look at the developing economies, a lot of the emissions that's gonna happen over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years is gonna be from production of steel as they improve their industrial activity, is gonna be through the production of cement, is going to the production of petrochemicals, uh, and so on and so forth, right? The question is, how do you really address CO2 emissions from this sector, right? And so in that context, uh, we need to understand that we don't have much of substitutes. We don't have a substitute for steel. We do not have a substitute, for example, for plastics, which makes this mic, for example. We do not have substitutes for aluminum. So we need to figure out a way to abate the CO2 from those, uh, from those industries in a way uh, which makes most sense, economic sense uh, and technological sense. And carbon capture systems, for example, at large scale, which can be done most cost effectively, is probably a good solution to look at. And I think though there have been some projects in the world around carbon capture at fair amount of scale, a lot more needs to be done. We are talking about gigaton scale of carbon capture. Gigaton scale of carbon capture at a price or at a cost which makes sense. We're talking about cost about $20, $25 a ton of CO2 capture. We're not talking about $50 a ton. These are entirely and eminently possible because the technologies around carbon capture, which is important for abatement of CO2 in the industry, has been there for a long time. The question is investment, scale, and deployment. So I think that's an important piece that we need to address, right, in terms of how we abate CO2 in the developing country, uh, developing countries like India, as well as countries like, you know, outside of India. Uh, I think economic viability, that's fundamental to, uh, to transition, uh, unless you're able to reduce the green premium, right, um, which is the additional cost that you pay for manufacturing steel or manufacturing petrochemicals uh, over above the incumbent solutions, it is unlikely that in developing nations you will get market traction. The elasticities of these uh, products may bear some market traction in countries like US where the purchasing power is much higher, but in developing nations, it's much more difficult. So getting economic viability in terms of green premiums is gonna be fundamentally important. And I think the other thing that we need to talk about is that CO2 does not have borders. And so while we can talk about 45Q policies in the United States, while Europe can talk about ETS, that does not prevent carbon leakages right, in terms of outsourcing carbon dioxide emissions to China, or India for that matter. And then the question becomes, how do you address that? Um, do you have a border tax? Well, heck no, because you do not know how the border tax is gonna affect the CO2 when the supply chain is global. And so I think with this thorny issue about how do you really manage carbon leakages and how do you coordinate global policies to be able to really address the CO2 leakage and CO2 abatement issues that you're talking about. Um, and, and China and India, they're the biggest challenge, although they are not the largest emitters on a per capita basis. I think people talk about absolute volumes, but that's only one indicator. What is my per capita consumption, uh, per, cap per capita emission of CO2 in terms of, uh, you know, in, in India or in China? And you'll see that's much lower than what it is in the United States, right? For example, at 15 tons uh, per capita, or Europe at about seven. Uh, China is a little higher at about seven, for example. Saudi Arabia is at 19. India is about two. So the question is, how do, you, how do you really address this equity issue in terms of what is the emission? Uh, and finally, I think the whole thing on climate justice. The argument that an India will give in COP26 is gonna be that, hey, look, you guys in developed nations, you know, for the past 150 years, have put in CO2, right, to the tune of three gigatons in the atmosphere. And we are just about climate economic ladder. We have got a per capita emission of two tons, right? And we're not putting anything comparable to what you have put in. So why should we pay for the CO2 for when we're climbing up the economic ladder? So 
That's a thorny question. And I think one of my acquaintances, Raghuram Rajan, who's out of Chicago, and who was the former uh, you know, Federal Reserve Governor uh, in, 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 in India, uh, you know, he, he, he laid out an elegant model where he talks about this whole thing around uh, Global Carbon Incentive Fund, where uh, the emitters who have got a much higher per capita emission right fund, the emitters who have got a much lower per capita emission. So for example, if you look at uh, the global emission on an average basis, about five tons per capita, right? The United States, 15 tons, right? And India is two tons. So US, for example, at a carbon price, let's say $30 per ton, puts in into a common fund, 15 minus five into 30, right, into the population, with about $100 billion into the fund. And India, on the other hand, gets two mi five minus two into 30 to 1.2 billion as, you know, funds supports its development of, uh, you know, climate, climate abatement. So I think this is a fairly elegant model, but this can be something that we thought of in terms of engendering climate justice, right, and equity across different nations with different levels of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, uh, this is some data around uh, India's energy and emission profile. And again, like I said, uh, if you look at it, um, it's about you know, 2.4, 2.5 gigatons at this point of time, probably going to about um, four gigatons, right, in about 10 years' time. If you look at the mix, uh, electricity certainly is one part, about 30%. But the majority of that growth is going to be in the industrial sector, as you see, right? About 1.2 gigatons going into the, you know, into, into the industrial sector in terms of CO2, CO2 emissions. And uh, transport and other sectors are not that much. However, if you look at the, the, the policies that have been undertaken in India, uh, the, the reduction in CO2 emissions on a per kilowatt hour basis in the electricity sector is, uh, I think, significantly, uh, is significantly good, if you will. Uh, from a 0 0.70 tons of CO2 per megawatt hour going down to 0.48 with a mix of renewables, which is uh, at about 27% of the energy basket, um, seems to be reasonable. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at it, the whole issue around rapid industrialization, right, that fuels the growth, that is going to emit quite a bit of CO2 um, you know, into, into the system. And if you look at that growth, uh, a significant portion of that CO2 emission is going to come from steel and cement. And the question then becomes, how do you abate that? You can't say you've got to stop making steel, right? You're stopping cement. And I think that's a challenge that one needs to address. And I think uh, equitable systems to be able to decarbonize um, uh, the industry as well as the power sector uh, needs to be addressed. And I think, having said that, again, this is, India is the third largest emitter in terms of CO2, but on a per capita basis, it is one of the lowest. I said about two, two tons per, uh, per, per, per capita. Uh, and even if it grows to four gigatons of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, emissions over the next 10 years, still you're talking about three tons per capita, right? So, so I think there's this fundamental uh, uh, issue that we need to address in terms of how do you reconcile the emissions with respect to economic growth and with respect to the emissions on a per capita basis. The next slide, please. And uh, here's some of, uh, some of the stated policy goals by the government of India in terms of what it is doing from a NDC, or nationally determined con contributions perspective. And I think uh, a lot of this has got to do with how do you reduce, reduce emissions to 33, 35% levels below 2005. 40% uh, of installed power generation capacity will be from non-fossil fuel, which is progressing pretty well. If you look at it from a power generation mix perspective, we have got about 100 gigawatts of capacity in India, um, which is based on renewables, We're going to about 450 giga gigawatts over the next 10 years. Coal is going to, going to be there. It's going to be there for the baseload capacity and also for supporting other power applications. Uh, and I think that's the, the question to ask is not, can we get away from coal? The question to ask, can we make coal much more efficient right, in the context of the country? Can we replace 85% of the units that are subcritical units in India with supercritical units, right? Which brings down the coal emissions to probably from one ton per megawatt hour to about 700 grams per megawatt hour. So, so I think those are the kind of things, choices that we need to make, right? And transportation, there's blending that's happening in terms of ethanol blending. And I think in the energy transition to new energy carriers, I think hydrogen emission is, is one, one big area. Again, I, I must say that the hydrogen out here we're talking about is blue hydrogen. Uh, although there's obviously a big, um, there's a big ambition towards going towards green hydrogen, but the reality is something very different. So we believe that 
Blue hydrogen from different sources of fuel blends is probably the right, right uh, solution to go forward, although there's a big emphasis by the prime minister on the green hydrogen. And I think finally, the, this, is, this is a coal gasification target. Like I said earlier, it's important to understand that uh, coal can be transformed right, into clean fuels. And so the government of India has gone into a coal gasification program to convert about 100 million tons of coal into gasified um, you know, energy derivative, which can be used for energy, um, uh, either for power production or for the use uh, in, in, in creating chemicals. So, so those are some of, the, some of the initiatives of the government of India. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, I think we think that from a perspective of uh, deep decarbonization, we have quite a broad-based systems approach. Uh, you know, I, I think people talk about carbon capture technology, people talk about renewables. The question is not that. The question is how do you combine this together in the most effective manner, right? And so we think that, you know, the energy carriers that we need to talk about, hydrogen, you know, from sources like uh, gas, from coal, from mixed fluid blend, from, for example, petco, which is a, a waste, uh, from, from electrolysis to the degree that's possible and makes sense, like methanol and, methanol and ammonia, and I think I talked about it before, is, is how do you capture carbon at GT scale, gigaton scale? The question is not to put about point-to-point -point carbon capture infrastructure. That's not scalable. We need to invest in large-scale carbon capture infrastructure, which commoditizes carbon dioxide capture and transport and disposition. And I think that the whole technology around gasification, right, which can be applied equally well towards biomass or mixed fuel blends or coal or pet coke, needs to be revisited and needs to be applied, and especially in the context of countries like India. Gasification technology, as you might know, came out of the United States as a response to the energy crisis in the 1970s, but then shale gas took over. But it has got big applications in terms of how you make this uh, carbon neutral and clean energy in developing countries. And then, of course, you could add that to wind, solar, hydro, and I think small modular nuclear, like traveling wave reactors that the Bill Gates and his folks are talk, talking about, like the Natrium Project in Wyoming, for example. And I think combining that together, we need to look at a systems approach in terms of combining technology, economics, markets, and policy to come with a solution in terms of carbon abatement. Not only the developing countries like India, but also outside. So I think, thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to questions later. Um, so many wonderful thoughts there, and it's going to segue, I think, very nicely into our next presentation from Todd Moss. So thank you for raising the issues of climate justice and climate equity. Um, so now I think we'll go virtually to Todd. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I wish I was in Houston. I'm jealous. Um, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to get down there soon. Um, First, any presentation on Africa must start with the caveat that, um, that it's a massive continent of more than a billion people in 54 countries, and it's not at all monolithic. Um, but there is a common, uh, a common characteristic, which is that nearly all of the economies, and I would say all the economies with the exception of South Africa, are what we call low emitting energy poor economies. And they face a very different set of challenges of most of the rest of the world, where they're also trying to decarbonize um, uh, their, their power sectors and their economies. So the, the first point I'd like to make is that Africans are going to need a lot more electricity in coming decades, because today they barely use any at all. Uh, the gaps are absolutely massive. Let's uh, go to the first slide. Um, can you see that? So that's my refrigerator in the orange on the right. Um, and that, that fridge uses uh, more electricity in a year than most citizens of most countries in Africa. Um, and when we look at economies as a whole, um, the gaps are pretty massive. Uh, let, let's go to the next slide, please. This is uh, the orange line on the top is the electricity used by um, by Americans playing video games. Um, that's just Americans just playing video games. And you can see that, that they use more electricity than entire nations, um, including Nigeria, uh, which is a country of 200 million people. Um, now, Nigeria, a, a very large uh, economy, um, uses extremely 
you know, small amounts of electricity. That nation uses about the same as Columbus, Ohio, or Jacksonville, Florida. So it's, re it's really just not very much. Um, and I do just a little side note that people often think, okay, well, we need to provide access to everybody at home. It's not just household access. Um, electricity is mostly used in industry and commerce and at scale. So the common solution of, well, let's just put a solar panel on everybody's home. Um, that's good for a part, you know, part of the market, but that's really not, um, not even close to, uh, to adequate for, for powering uh, everything that the continent's going to need for the next, uh, next generations. Um, and also that, of course, African economies, not only do they have very low consumption rates, but they suffer from the worst reliability measures and in many cases, some of the highest cost of electricity. So the gaps, the, the, you know, the mountain that has to be climbed is, is absolutely tremendous. Uh, my second point, in, and let's go to the next slide, is that Africans have essentially zero responsibility for causing climate change. Um, if you look, this is a graphic from Oxford University's Our World in Data. Um, this is a, a, a graph of cumulative CO2 emissions. Um, the box, the blue box in the corner is all of Africa. Once you take out South Africa, which is an exception, and some of the larger uh, North African economies, that little tiny light blue box is more than a billion people uh, responsible for um, about a little bit less than 1% um, of the global total. So really uh, th that billion plus people are, are just not responsible at all. Um, my third point is, is around the technology choices. So um, the African continent has a, a ton of energy resources, especially to produce power. Obviously, lots of untapped wind, solar. It is the region with, with the most un, still untapped hydro. Uh, parts of the east of East Africa have significant geothermal. Um, and of course, there's gas. Let me make a, qu a quick point that coal is abundant in South Africa, but it's effectively dead. We should not be worried about a coal uh, resurgence in Africa. I would be surprised. There might be one more Chinese built coal plant in Zimbabwe that's already broken ground. But I, I would I'd take a friendly bet that that will be the last uh, coal plant ever built in, in, in Africa. Um, uh, so we shouldn't worry about, we shouldn't worry about coal, but gas on the other hand, if we can go to the next slide, please. Gas is very important. A lot of countries in Africa are producing gas. Um, gas is useful not just for power, but for industrial heat, for fertilizer. Um, a lot of people in Africa, the vast majority of people in Africa still use wood or other biofuels for cooking and gas presents opportunities for cleaner cooking, especially indoor. Um, and of course, gas, if we want Africa to tap into that low cost wind and solar, gas actually works quite nicely. It pairs quite nicely with it. So there is likely a, uh, a, a future for gas in, in not all, but in many African uh, energy markets. Um, and then my final point is that the US and especially the, uh, our European allies are actually creating barriers that are blocking that path to a higher energy future for Africa. And they're doing so in a way that's, um, that's actually not doing anything to help solve climate. Um, uh, it, is, it is in a sense, all pain and no gain. Um, just to give you uh, an example, we have a new US government agency called the Development Finance Corporation or DFC, which, is, which was built to invest in largely in infrastructure in emerging and frontier markets. The DFC has set itself a goal of ending all fossil projects um, after 2029, and they've left themselves headroom for about eight mid-sized gas plants worldwide um, forever. Uh, so, you know, DFC, the, the big tool, US government tool we have for investing in, in infrastructure in markets like Africa, uh, 
is, is a, effectively getting out of all, all gas or all fossil fuels. There's also um, the World Bank is, is a big investor in infrastructure in, in this region. Uh, there's new US Treasury guidance, which calls on ending all support for all upstream oil and gas. And it leaves a narrow window for some downstream gas, but it's under pretty tight conditions that when you add it all up, it, it, it means that a few projects will get through, but probably very few. Um, now, this, these steps will all have harmful effects on Africa's development plans and especially its ability to create jobs uh, in the future. Um, and at the same time, the, the, that harm is not really helping us with the climate. It's not, it, it's not gonna have much of an effect on, on the global commons uh, of global CO2. In fact, if we took an extreme position and we said, okay, Africa, if, if Africans tripled their electricity consumption and they did it only with gas, and no country is planning that, but if they tripled and they did it only with gas, the cumulative CO, the, the additional CO2 would equal less than 1% uh, of global CO2 emissions. So again, Africa is, is literally just a, a rounding error. Um, and then, you know, I was a diplomat. Um, there are some geostrategic and diplomatic um, uh, costs to, to this position. It's certainly going to undermine U.S. influence, uh, including, I believe, in, in, in Glasgow um, at COP26. Uh, one of the previous um, uh, speakers, I think Gabe, mentioned that, um, that the rest of the world doesn't see the issues siloed the way we try to do that. I know that the um, anger and frustration at the United States and the West in general right now from African leaders over vaccine nationalism is coming to a boil. Um, and I do worry that we're going to see some of that in Glasgow, where there, you know, the hypocrisy of of our um, our position and certainly the European position is pretty bad. I showed you the um, the California uh, gamers uh, uh, slide already, but we're we're literally fighting over a handful of gas power plants whether finance should be allowed. Um, in, you know, we're talking in most markets, single digit power plants. Um, so let's go to just my last slide, um, which shows the number of power plants in countries running on fossil fuels. Uh, in Kenya, there are nine. In Tanzania, there are 11. In Nigeria, again, over 200 million people, there are 18. And in the United States, there's well, well over 3,000. So, you know, we're not in a very strong position to be telling, the, you know, the Nigerians not to build, a, you know, another 5, 10, 20 uh, gas fired power plants. But that is the position we're in today. So, you know, again, these low, low emitting energy poor economies across Africa have have particular needs that are different. Um, African leaders absolutely want to play their their part in fighting climate change. Uh, but the U.S. and especially the Europeans are, are going to have to meet them halfway. So thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, the graphics are very striking to me. I think <laughs> they are great visual representations of some of the disparities that we are talking about today. So um, thank you for that. And with that, I think we're going to move to the Americas. So Tomas. As well. So good, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for the to the Baker Institute for inviting me here, and to Baker both for hosting such a an interesting uh, seminar. Uh, let me let me start by saying that energy transitions, in a way, resemble, I think, what what a lot of political consultants say. When you talk to political consultants, they say that every campaign, every political campaign is the same, but every political campaign is different. And they also say that all politics is local. And I think that these two things apply very directly to energy transitions. And we'll see how things look like from, from Latin America. Uh, let me start by saying that when you look at how things are going, when you look at the pledges that have been made by the countries, they are insufficient and they have been reviewed by, by, by many institutions and by many think tanks that look at this, and they have been deemed insufficient. Uh, and how we go from here will depend, I think, on how we answer on the answers to six questions. So let me, let me start. Can I 
can I pass with this? Ah, okay, yeah, okay, perfect. So these are the six questions that are shaping any transition in Latin America according to, to our view. So the first of all is, is climate change the most pressing issue? If you look at the graph on the left, you will see the poverty rates as those are the national poverty lines and these are the percentages of people in each of these countries that are below the poverty line. And if you, if you add up all these people, they amount to over 180 million people. So this is roughly the size of Mexico plus Texas plus California. This is the amount of, of poor people we have. And if we have Europeans in, in the audience or, or watching us uh, digitally, uh, it would be roughly like the UK, France and, Ger and, France and, and Italy, roughly. And when you look at what authority beyond the statistics looks like, you see, for example, that 51% of students in primary when they reach the, 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 mid, the end of, of primary school, 51% uh, of them don't have the proficiency in reading that they should have. This means foregone jobs, this means lower productivity. When you look, for example, in the case of Colombia, at the amount of people that don't, are, are not able to have three meals a day is roughly a third of the population. So poverty imposes real costs that, we have, that have to be borne today. These are not future costs, but costs that have to be borne today. And if you look at the, at the table in the right, in the, yes, in the right hand side, those are the bottom 25 countries by inequality. And if you see all the shaded countries, these are Latin American countries. So we have 11 countries in the bottom 25% in terms of, of, of inequality. And these countries amount roughly to 70% of the population. So inequality alongside poverty means there's a lot of political tension. There's a lot of demand for change. And this is, this is the, the probably the strongest forces we're seeing. So when you look at climate change, you cannot forget this. And when resources are limited, you have to bear in mind that you have to make choices. So climate change is important. The continent and the region is vulnerable to climate change, but we have also very important issues we have to take care of. This leads to the next slide, which is okay. If, if getting out of poverty needs such a massive investment, where are we going to get our money from? Who's going to pay for this? Which is a question that repeatedly has appeared along this seminar. So what I did here was to value fossil fuel reserves in the, in the region. And when you look at the fossil fuel reserves and you compare them with central government debt, for example, you will see that in the first list of countries, above the, what it says subtotal, which is Trinidad, Tobago, Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Venezuela, almost 80% of the population lives in these countries that are net exporters of energy. So when you look at those countries, you will see that the fossil fuel reserves are almost 10 times the central government debt. And they amount, if you look at the whole of the region, it's almost five times, more than five times, the revenue you get from taxes. So the question is, if we're going to do an energy transition that moves us away from fossils, are we going to leave all this wealth on the ground? Can we afford to leave all this wealth on the ground, given the previous slide? So it's, again, a very hard choice. So then we say, okay, most of the discussions point out that, that clean energy should be the, the pathway. So let's look at what can energy do. When you look at clean energy, what I did here, and this is only for Colombia, what I did here was compare what the different sectors in the economy can do and to compare what electricity, how, how strong is electricity compared to other sectors in terms of achieving important policy objectives. So what you, what you will see in the, in the columns are important policy objectives. First, the speed of recovery, how fast can an economy recover, uh, how much can a country contribute to a recovery, to the speed of recovery after a recession. Second, the total multiplier is how much can a specific sector move the economy. The third one, is in terms of units of GDP, how much emissions does each sector provide? Then we have how, much, how many jobs per unit of GDP produced. Then you have how many taxes and royalties do you get from, from a unit of GDP produced. And then the percentage of people, of vulnerable people, of poor people that are employed by, the, by each of the sectors. When you see 100% is the sector that has the greatest ability to move forward in that objective. When you see lower percentages, it's the country, the sector has less ability. So this big chart <coughs> is graphed in the, in the right. 
And what you see here is the green line is oil and gas and the blue line is electricity. We, we of course, don't have yet that much amount of, of, of investment in, in renewables, in, in non-conventional renewables, because we have a lot of hydro. But what you see here is that electricity is very good at coming back, at helping you coming up from a recession, coming back from a recession. This is, this is a power it has. It also has a good ability to move the economy. It's not the most powerful sector to move the rest of the economy, but it helps in doing so. And it's also good in terms of emission, doesn't emit very much. So those policy objectives, certainly energy, electricity investments can help on that. But when you look at tax collection, when you look at employment and jobs, and when you look at employing vulnerable people, the electricity sector is not the first place one would like to go if one is a policymaker responsible for dealing with the problems we saw in the first slide. So electricity does play a role, must play a role, can play a role, but electricity alone will not be able to help us solve all of our pressing development challenges. So and what about the focus? Should the focus be, in terms of decarbonization, should the focus be on electricity? The left-hand side is also from, from our world in data. This is how the world emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, split. And you see there the great, the, the, the big slice of the pie is energy. Almost three quarters of emissions come from energy. And when you look at Colombia, you, which is on the right, you see that's almost a third. So it's ve a very different story. Not only is the region responsible for around 6% of global emissions, but when you look at countries like Colombia, you see that it's not energy where the focus should be. When you see the green slice, the green slice is, is the use of land, agricultural, forestry, and land use. And when you look at the region as a whole, it's not exactly like Colombia, but uh, energy accounts for around 40% of emissions. These are estimates that have some, some years now, but, but roughly uh, it should be something below 50%. So then again, energy and energy production is not the main source of the problem. Now, once you see all these, you have to ask yourself, and can we get the politics right? And here there are four pictures, recent pictures, from, from different countries around the region. The first one in the top left is Mexico. And in Mexico, it was a 14 to 20% price increase in 2016. And it caused massive protest and massive uh, uh, anger from the people. Then you see to the right, you see Chile. Chile had a 4% increase in the subway fare. And it just, it just, it was a trigger for a bigger explosion, and they ended up changing the constitution. So it was, it was not just a minor, a minor thing. They are, they are now in the process of changing the constitution, and 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 this protest and the the way the country tried to solve the protest led to a change in the constitution. You see Ecuador. In Ecuador, it was a very. It, 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 they didn't attempt to do it to do it subtly. They just put a 123 percent increase in in. in fuel prices, and also it led to massive protests. The, whole, the government had to back down. There were lots of people injured and killed. And then you have my country in the, in the bottom right, which is probably the most recent case, which is April this year. They, they put forward a tax reform that had a lot of redistributive goals uh, that was taxing the middle class, but also it was taxing uh, the richest people. And it had a, a, a carbon tax as well. We have a, tarbon, a carbon tax, but we have a lot of exemptions. So they tried to put the fuels that were not there uh, in the reform. And it caused a terrible, terrible protest. And we, we, we didn't end up reforming the constitution, but, we, but we, we, we ended up with a very difficult situation and with a lot of reforms that we don't know yet where they're heading. So when you connect these four pictures and you think about what's going on, what you see is that people are very mistrustful of elites. People don't trust the system. People don't think the system can give them the things they need. People want things now. People want to represent themselves and they want their own voice to be heard in the streets. So when you have such a situation, it's very important when you're going to tackle policies that will imply changing prices of things. It's not only how much the prices will increase, but it's a lot about who is going to bear the cost and who is going to reap the benefits. And this is as important as how much you increase prices. So can we get the politics right? Bear in mind that in the next two years, 50% of the population living in Latin America and the Caribbean will have elections. And this is becoming an electoral issue. And we don't know if this is going to end up favoring populism and complicating things in a geopolitical sense. I mean, see what has happened with Venezuela. 
or if we will be able to steer things clear. But we need to send a very clear message that transitions can be made in an equitable manner. And finally, the other big question is how much change do we require to get to net zero? And that's a question that depends on, on a lot of, of, of uncertainties. These have been mention, mentioned throughout the seminar. But this is uh, estimations we've done at the, at the Energy Center. In the, in the left, what you see is what would happen if net zero is reaching 2070. And in the right is what we think would happen if we reach net zero in 2050. And you can see the different fuels. The energy demand is, is roughly similar. The final energy demand is roughly similar. But the composition is very different. And what, what, what is really different is the orange and gray areas in the bars. If you look at 2050, when you decarbonize very quickly, the picture on the right, you will see that the economy has to electrify very, very, very rapidly. And natural gas and hydrocarbons have a very small role to play. And when you look at what this matters and why is this important, it's because of the investment that the economy will have to do, how much you will have to change to be able to, electri to electrify. So think about, for example, transportation, which is a difficult sector in Latin America. Transportation, we use a lot of old trucks, a lot of old cars. We've tried in the past to pay people to sell their old trucks and their, their old buses, pay them to do that so we can modernize the fleet, and it has gone horribly wrong. The political economy of this is very difficult, and truckers can put their, their, their trucks in the roads and block the roads and, and paralyze the economy. This is a power they have. So this is an example of something that is different. What about house households that have invested a lot of on appliances uh, to consume natural gas? What are we going to tell them when they have to change? How are we going to help them? What about, uh, well, there are, there are many, many, many examples. What about uh, coal miners? What are we going to do with them? That they are very important in the center of the country. Are we willing to pay? How are we going to transition them from what they've done for generations? So all these, these nuances, all these, uh, these things, are going to determine in a, in a very important way what happens. Of course, it, we, if, if we decarbonize to 2070, then the transition will probably proceed at a, at a pace that is more palatable to the, to the country and to the population. Uh, but that will depend on how the discussion goes. So let me, from, from these six questions, let me put three takeaways or suggest three takeaways. The first thing is the energy transition agenda cannot be unidimensional, and it feels unidimensional. What you get in a lot of the conversations and discussions is how much renewables are you going to have? How quickly are you going to decarbonize your energy sector? So if it's unidimensional, it's, I think it's going to fail because the, the, the discussion is broader. Secondly, we need to get the micro right. If we don't get the micro right, if we don't get the incentives right, we will not get the macro right. We will never achieve the targets that we want to achieve. And this implies being very careful on understand where the emissions come from and what are the sensitivities and what are the costs. And thirdly, if we don't set realistic goals, we may end up paying a very high price. And I'm, I'm especially concerned about political costs because voters have been telling us that they reject proposals that they don't see as equitable, as fair. Uh, so we may end up, if we push too hard or too quickly or push in a way that doesn't seem to, doesn't, uh, is not perceived as fair by voters, we may end up being kicked out of, of government and, and, and the populists coming in. Or we may end up making commitments that we are not able to, to, to fulfill. Or we may end up putting the economy under a lot of stress and under very high costs. So all transitions are different. This is the way I think things are going in Latin America. And I think uh, we should bear this in mind when we engage in, in, in discussions and try to move forward in Glasgow. So thank you very much. And I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Tomas. That was a wonderful example of all of the difficult decisions and choices that governments are having to make and the very real impact those can have. So I think now we'll come kind of back home um, with <laughs> Nicole Gibson, but also to Europe. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to Baker Botts as well uh, and the Baker Institute. 
And hello to everyone here in person. I agree, this is fantastic. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've done this. I hope we keep doing it. Thank you. And hello to everyone virtually. So there's a lot of people still out there. Uh, we hope that, that you're listening and that you've had a great, great time these two days. I certainly have, I've learned a lot. Uh, today, I'm delighted to join you to discuss decarbonization and the road to Glasgow from a US policy in Europe perspective. As Julie mentioned, I work at the US Department of State. I'm in the Energy Resources Bureau and I lead European energy diplomacy. The Bureau develops and implements energy policy also around the world. On September 23rd, Secretary of State Blinken was at the United Nations Security Council meeting on climate and security. And he said that President Biden has made addressing the climate crisis a top priority of our administration to ensure it's a core element of US foreign policy. We're taking into account how every bilateral, every multilateral engagement that we have every policy decision that we make will impact our goal of putting the world on a safer, more sustainable path. What many people want to know, and what we've heard about today and yesterday, is how are we going to get there? The US energy policy is focused on three areas. One, decarbonization of global energy systems to address the climate crisis. Two, energy security for the United States, our allies, our partners. Three, energy development and access to promote economic growth and prosperity around the world. We see decarbonization and energy security as mutually reinforcing, particularly in Europe. Since 2009, we've held talks with the EU as part of the US-EU Energy Council. We meet at all levels to discuss energy policy issues, and share best practices used by industry and used by governments around the world. We also identify shared priorities that we support and coordinate on. Next slide, please. Actually, we need to go one more. <laughs> I didn't ask for the first one. Thank you. Europe has long been a leader in the energy transition. The European Union's Green Deal aims for net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. It also aims to decouple economic growth from energy intensity and to leave no one behind and protect the most vulnerable. Non-EU countries in the region have also committed to net zero targets. We have Norway, Ukraine, the Western Balkans. The US government stands behind these goals for net zero economies by 2050. Our own goal is to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 also, and net zero power sector by 2035. Net zero targets are good for the environment. They can also bolster energy security by diversifying fuel types, particularly renewable resources. They safeguard human health by reducing harmful pollutants. The various paths to net zero come with significant economic opportunities as well, both in the United States and around the world. Clean energy initiatives mean bolstering, boosting innovation, and creating new jobs. That's where you, the energy sector, and energy companies come in. The US companies, our partners, and competitors around the world are leaders in technology R&D and innovating. And the US government wants to work with you, partner with you, and promote best practices that you develop. We want to work with you to move from ambitious climate targets to achieving them. Next slide, please. We know that the energy transition will be more challenging for some countries. It can depend on the carbon intensive, how carbon intensive a country's energy mix is right now. It also hinges on getting the financing to change that. In many European countries, particularly in Central and South Central Europe, coal has long dominated the energy mix. And as we know, coal causes air pollution, contributes to climate change, damages human health, and holds back economic growth. Next slide, please. Some of these countries are turning to natural gas to phase out coal and complement renewables. Going forward, infrastructure projects can also be future-proofed 
to transport hydrogen and further the clean energy transition, such as when hydrogen is produced by renewable energy. We are seeing companies in Europe exploring new applications for hydrogen. The European Union is aiming for 40 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers by 2030 to supply green hydrogen for industry, transport, and other applications. Along with the G7 countries, the United States has committed to ending new direct government support for unabated international thermal coal power generation by the end of 2021. Advance slide, please. The EU has made similar financing commitments. Its sustainable finance taxonomy aims to direct investment into green activities. We are working with our EU counterparts to avoid a patchwork of differing disparate standards. I think that's something we've heard a lot about these last two days. For example, the United States consistently advocates for nuclear energy as a necessary climate solution. We'll need to work closely with the private sector financial institutions to mobilize and align the trillions we need to decarbonize the global economy. The good news is that lots of encouraging work is being done already. We've recently seen some of the largest commercial and investment banks and asset owners and managers around the world commit to a future of net zero by 2050. U.S. companies are also setting net zero targets in increasing numbers. As global markets move away from coal and other fossil fuels, we want to work with industry, our European allies and partners to build reliable, sustainable, and cleaner energy mixes. How do we ensure that no one gets left behind? President Biden just announced at the UN General Assembly that the US intends to further double international climate finance for developing countries to over 11 billion a year. The United States will continue to work with others to collectively mobilize 100 billion in climate finance as soon as possible. As part of this, the United States intends to further double adaptation finance building on the tripling announced at the Leaders' Summit on Climate in April. In the multilateral development banks, we are also committing U.S. government resources and financial support to prioritizing clean energy, innovation, and energy efficiency. The European Union, through its Recovery and Resilience Facility, the Just Transition Fund, and other mechanisms, is also dedicating funding to member states and neighboring countries to support the energy transition. Together, the EU, with its member states, the European Investment Bank, are contributing or have contributed just over 23 billion euros in 2019 to developing countries for climate finance. If used strategically, government financing can help mobilize trillions more in private capital. This will create additional opportunities for industry to lead the way. I want to emphasize that the energy transition will only happen if deliberate, intensive inter with in uh, deliberate, intensive international cooperation and shared climate ambitions. It requires meaningful action from governments and also the private sector. Bold action to tackle the climate crisis will put us on a sustainable path. We have the opportunity now to safeguard our health, grow our economies, and protect the environment. The U.S. government looks forward to working with you. Please let us know how we can help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions. And I anticipate that we'll have a lot of them <laughs> because we covered, uh, I see them coming in now, um, because we covered a lot of ground. Um, and I mean that both literally in the sense that we've tried to take our thank you trip around the world um, but also substantively you know we've heard a lot of different themes and and really I do think this panel has been the perfect panel to end our summit because we've touched on a lot of the things that have been discussed over the course of the last two days and we've heard a lot of disparate opinions even amongst the panel. Um, you know, we've heard both that coal is very important to certain economies, can be very clean, there are benefits to it, and also 
some countervailing um, views on coal and its role in the energy mix. So perhaps let's maybe go back to the beginning and start by talking a little bit about coal. And Nicole, I might address this first one to you. Um, so how do we square the, the difference between thinking about coal as maybe something that we'd like to limit a little bit and thinking about all of the government commitments that have been made toward net zero, particularly in the European countries, as you just outlined. Um, and then yet we've got increasing coal-based and coal-fired generation and other infrastructure being developed. How do we square those competing thoughts? Well, wh what's interesting is right now, coal price is actually going up. And, and that's quite interesting. Um, but it's, it's partly because it's being limited. Um, there's a lot of countries, especially in Europe, that are phasing out of coal and turning to natural gas. Uh, yet, at the same time, and we've heard this a couple times uh, during this, this summit, uh, natural gas prices are soaring in Europe. And so um, there's also nuclear. Uh, nuclear is also something that, um, and I mentioned that the US, U.S. government supports nuclear. Many countries are moving away from nuclear. Um, there's proponents, um, there's opponents. Uh, but the thing is about nuclear is it powers always on. And that's what you're not getting um, with the renewables that the situation with the pricing, what's happening is we're not seeing the wind blow in Europe. That's in the last couple of weeks. And then there's been a lot of cold, extended cold winter. Um, I can say that we're also concerned about what's going to happen this coming winter. And so a lot of folks, perhaps um, the price of gas is, is being driven by uh, trying to fill up storage levels to get ready for what the winter is going to hold. Um, but what are you going to do when you've got a high gas price? Coal's cheaper, uh, so you're going to use coal. And I think that's what we're seeing now. But um, we'd like to see that, that change um, to a different type of mix in the future. And I think we've got a lot of technological advances that we've talked about. Um, and we, we don't have it. We don't have the answers yet. Um, but we're getting there. People are working on them. And we're really confident that we can actually make that change in the future. What you're seeing now is, is the beginning. Thank you. Gabe, I think you have some thoughts, too. <laughs> yeah, and I'll keep it very short. So we have to be critically attuned to commodity prices, because first of all, as, as Nicole's saying, there's fuel switching. This isn't just a European issue. You know, one of the things that helped push coal out of the system here in the United States to the degree it has is not just coal plants reaching retirement age, it's the fact that you saw coal and gas prices converging, and then in a lot of cases, gas becoming cheaper. If we were to take certain domestic policy steps here in the US, for instance, you know, some of the proposals that are probably over time very adverse to natural gas production, and you start seeing Henry Hub at six or seven dollars instead of the levels it's been over the last decade, I think you start to have a very different conversation about coal uh, in our country as well. And then I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve the rest, but I think that's, yeah, <laughs> and I think I may, he's, got, he's got points too. Just so. a quick comment on that, yeah, right? If sure. you look at some of, the, some of the developments in Germany, for example, Germany was the biggest proponent of renewables, right? And if you look at the, the cost of power in Germany, right, it's about 35 cents per kilowatt hour, it went about 100% over what it was originally. At the same time, because they didn't have the right portfolio mix in terms of the power generation capacity of renewables, they still have to support that with 80 gigawatts of coal power plants. Mm -hmm. So in effect, you did not really bring the emissions down anything significantly. You continue to have the assets of coal to support your wind and uh, you know, the, the solar resources, and your power prices are like 35 cents a kilowatt hour. So I think the design of the portfolio is extremely important, right? And we shouldn't have any of these, you know, these, 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 these mental models, right? That, oh, we shouldn't go for gas. Oh, we shouldn't go for nuclear. Oh, we I think we got to get those out. And I think a lot of it's political. A lot of it's driven by, you know, some of these ideologies that you have got. And I think to do the right thing, you've got to really look at the economics and how you design the portfolio in the best possible way, which makes more sense. The systemic impact, because like if you look at German or EU-wide emissions of carbon per million BTUs of energy consumed versus the United States, 
they're essentially on parity, and yet Germany's paying about four times as much per kilowatt hour of electricity as we are here. Well, money still talks, right? <laughs> and, and I think we've, we've talked about that in a couple of different ways here. Um, and you know, maybe that's a nice segue into a question that I have for you, Atanu, um, because we've talked a lot, even over the past couple of days, about uh, natural gas potentially being a very critical part of the energy transition. And in fact, Dr. Foss yesterday made a compelling argument for increasing the efficiency of natural gas in addition to or potentially in lieu of certain alternative um, strategies. How do we reconcile that with some of the potential economic issues? Um, maybe the difference between the landed price of U.S. Na LNG in India versus the price of domestic coal? Sure, absolutely, and I think that's a great question because um, countries like India, for example, um, they do not have natural gas, and they got to import natural gas as LNG, uh, either from Qatar, Ras Gas, or from the U.S., mm -hmm. Chenier, uh, Sabine mm -hmm. Pass, for example, to some degree from Australia. Mm -hmm. And the landed price of LNG in India um, it's probably on the long-term take-or-pay contract, it's probably about $10 from MWTU. That is significantly different from the $3 or $4 General Henry Hub price. Mm -hmm. And at $10, and after that, moving it through the logistical infrastructure of India, which is quite creaky, right? You land up at about $12 per MWTU at the plant gates or the power gates. At $12, you do not have a business economic model that supports power generation, right? It may support, to some degree, uh, conversion to chemicals, right, and conversion to higher value-added derivatives, but in general, LNG at that price, uh, gas at that price, does not support the power model, which cannot be more than probably about eight to 10 cents, seven to 10 cents probably, in terms of uh, per unit for consumption by the residences or by the, by the commercial institutions. So we think that LNG and gas is going to be a fuel which is going to be support the flexibility in terms of renewables because India is going to go big time in renewables. I, I think because of the fact that it's the geography is pretty much suited for renewables, but then renewables again will not give you the base load. So I think for supporting flexibility, you will have uh, LNG and gas as, as a supporting mechanism. You will have some LNG and gas, natural gas uh, for supporting the industry. But I think a lot of it's going to develop in terms of how you develop the gasification industry out there. And you're, you're able to generate derivative gases in terms of syngas and hydrogen and spike it with, with natural gas to get you uh, the cost from MMBTU to probably sub $5 levels. If you come to that level, then you're talking about some business models working. So I think that's the way it's going to move probably in India over the next 40 plus decade or so. Excellent. Um, so maybe we can switch and talk a little bit about energy equity. Um, it's where our, our last panel kind of left off, asking some big questions and, uh, and then running out of time, quite frankly, the way that we will probably do here as well. Um, but you know, we heard in particular from, from Todd and uh, from Tomas about some very difficult decisions that governments have to make and some very stark disparities between who's contributing to the climate crisis, I'll put that in quotation marks, and then also um, you know, the fact that a lot of the, the imposed global standards and policies and the things that we all want to strive toward are um, you know, hitting everyone equally, um, regardless of what they've contributed to date. And so as some of the countries that have the greatest financial resources, are trying to impose these universal restrictions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, to halt um, or slow down climate change and its impact, how should we be thinking about energy equity, particularly in the developing countries and, and thinking about that disproportionate impact? So perhaps I'm looking at you, Tomas, maybe we could start with you and go to Todd. Yes, yes, of course. It, first of all, let me say I think this should be something that is a choice, but I think it's a necessity that you include this in climate talks and climate negotiations. And I think there are two, two fundamental reasons for this. The first one is more of a, a matter of principle, uh, if you will, of an ethical issue, which is the principle of shared responsibility. 
most of the emissions that, that we currently have and most of the carbon budget we have has been used by developed countries. So I think this creates the, the need. But second of all, it's a practical reason because if you don't do it, it will not work. More than half of emissions come from developing countries. So if you don't engage properly, it's not gonna work. And I think that when you look at the practical steps, there are, there are a number of things you could do. The first one starts with the engagement. And I think the engagement should be, I want to talk about this, what do you want to talk about? Which is different from a, from a more one-sided conversation. Second of all, you, th you need to, to explore what the optimal solution for each country or each region is. And be willing to, to understand that and to invest in that. And, and thirdly, I think you need some success stories. Countries need success stories to see, look what happened to this country. If I engage properly, I'm going to do good as well. I will, have, I will be able to transition in a least costly manner. So I think these, these three things under these two principles would probably work very well when approaching this, this issue. Todd, any thoughts? So, you know, in thinking about energy equity, you know, the starting point is that we just can't have a two tier, a two tier world where something like, you know, gas and gas pipelines are all about energy security for rich countries. Um, but we can't afford for poor countries to build that same infrastructure. Um, I mean, that's just not, you know, th this is a fighting, you know, combating climate change is a collective action problem. And if we're starting from the notion that, uh, that, um, that, you know, that we're treating countries in different places because of their relative uh, influence in the world, that's not a, that's not a recipe for, uh, for collective action. Um, the other is that, you know, um, you know, at least I, like I work on sub-Saharan Africa, African leaders are not passive actors. Uh, just like Tomas is saying, you know, in Latin America, the political pressures and the political priorities are different uh, and they're very real. Um, and leaders have agency, they have plans. And, um, and that starting point has to be about what, how do we integrate uh, our climate goals with their top priorities, which in most countries I work on, the top priority is job creation. So how can we ensure that energy investments are climate smart, but also, um, but also are doing in a way that's not gonna hold back development because that's, that's gonna be non-negotiable uh, from a leadership standpoint. Just one sentence. So, and, and this is maybe from a more parochial U.S. perspective, but with global impact, is I think one of the biggest things we can do, and there's a slight nudge to our colleagues in government here, is probably one of the best things, and I'm curious to hear Todd's view and Tomas's view, is for the United States, given its influence, to basically facilitate by getting out of the way. And what I mean by this is for instance, with both multilateral institutions, and I would argue with our private financial institutions here domestically, is make it very clear that there's blessing from on high for supporting some of these energy abundance projects uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and other regions. You know, For instance, the development of gas. It's something that comes at low cost to us and would have such great benefits in each of those regions. Just a quick comment, if you will. So I, I think one of the things that I think Julie you raise. I, I think the countries which have got a higher per capita emission uh, and richer are, are richer need to support the developing countries with, with uh, climate spot technologies in terms of funding. I just talked about a funding mechanism that you can do based on the, the inequity of, of the CO2 emissions. And, and I think that may well be a, a way to kind of like fund climate smart infrastructure, climate spot uh, uh, industrial activity in these countries. And I think that's one way to do that because the nationally determined contributions is a good way to start. But in general, poor countries or countries which have lesser resources have a propensity to cheat, you know, uh, and, and a propensity to free ride. And if that unravels, then the whole thing breaks down. So funding is an important piece to drive the cohesion and cooperation across, you know, the different countries to achieve the specific climate goals. That's a great segue into what I think will have to be our last question. Um, the time flies very quickly up here, and this is an audience question. 
Um, so I'd like to see if each of you could give, our, give your thoughts, and we'll start with Todd, let's say. Um, so the question is, given the disparity of perspectives and realities around the world, what outcome can we expect from Glasgow in your assessment? And so that's a very broad question. Perhaps let's narrow it down to one thing that you would either hope to see come out of Glasgow or that you expect might come out of Glasgow. So Todd, can we start with you? Sure. Um, what I hope what, what I hope we'll see from Glasgow is a, a clear and um, compelling uh, case from, uh, from African leaders about what their priorities are and how they can, how those priorities can fit into a, you know, a collective global effort to reduce climate change. Um, there is, there is, you know, there's a plenty of space for a flexible solution that lands there. Um, but we're not headed in that direction right now. And certainly geostrategically for the United States, you know, we, there, there is a path we could carve in a sense between uh, China's position and, you know, China's technology entirely neutral position and uh, Europe's sort of renewables only uh, extremism. Um, there is a space for the United States. Um, I fear that where we're going now with the U.S. Treasury guidance is going to take us down a dead end, but th there is that opportunity both for the African leadership and for the United States to position ourselves for uh, for success in the next round. Yeah, I, 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 I would again say that apart from uh, kind of like getting a, uh, a consensus on the NDCs or the nationally determined contributions, probably more important is to get a consensus on how the funding happens. There have been talks about for the past many years of you know, countries funding to the tune of $100 billion per year for uh, climate smart technologies and climate abatement in the developing nations. Nothing much happened, right? So if you can put a mechanism in place and get consensus around what the funding mechanisms are going to be to fund the development of technologies that fund the development of economies which, are, uh, which can abate CO2 emissions to the degrees that's required by NDC, that'll be a good start, I would imagine. So I think we've, we've had some good hope, uh, you know, exhortations here. So I'll give an expectations-based one. And what I would expect at this point, and I think it reflects a lot of what we've talked about today, is basically a triangle of diplomatic conflict where the most intense leg is going to be between the U.S. and China because climate is layered into all these other pre-existing issues of tension. But I think there's going to be a, you know, maybe less visible or less appreciated but very real vector of conflict between the United States and you know some of our erstwhile partners in the developing world not over some of these various equity issues and also the reality that some of these climate and energy transition issues both in Africa and Latin America could feed into some of the migration crises that we already have and if that occurs in a less liberal political context domestically that's also influenced by these issues that's you know maybe not somewhere we want to be. So uh, that's a great question, and I think it's a perfect question for, for the close of our panel. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about commitments. We continue to hear about commitments. What I've heard a lot about for the last two days is the action, and I think we need the action. So um, something, uh, I always try to not get ahead of the deliverables at COPS, um, but the, it's already been announced. So there's a methane pledge that the US is doing with the EU and we'd like to have other countries join us. Um, methane is something we haven't talked a lot about. There's been a lot of discussion about CO2. Methane is equally as important. And so um, I think that the pledge, another pledge, uh, but maybe I really think that this COP could be the COP that turns it around and we've got these commitments. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, making sure the poor don't bear the brunt of what we're trying to do um, if, if we, we are in the, the more developed world. Um, and I'd really like to see us move forward with, with great technologies, and I think industry leads the way to do that. This is a very good question. I, <clears throat> I think that in the end, what we have, <clears throat> sorry, uh, building on Atanu's point, we have a, a free rider problem, potentially free rider problem, and the, and the way you can solve this is either you can tax people, 
to pay for the good. You can pay for the cost, somehow find the money to pay for the cost, or you can appeal to, good, to, to the good nature of people. And what, what the combination is, is, is going to look different, I think, with, with, with in every case. But the thing that strikes me the most is that I don't see detailed plans. I see a lot of discussion on targets, but I don't see detailed plans. And when you don't have a detailed plan, it's very hard to know what will it actually take. You don't know what the true costs are. You don't know what the trade-offs are. You don't know if things look as bad as you expect in some areas, but probably better in other areas. So if we don't get countries to build detailed plans with the private sector, who's going to end up doing most of the investments. It's going to be very hard to determine which is the actual need be mix between taxing, paying, appealing to good nature. And hopefully, from Glasgow, we, we get a mandate that every country has to submit a very detailed plan. I, d I don't see these discussions taking place in, in, in the region yet. And from what I heard yesterday from, from Michel, uh, there are a lot of big discussions that are not even happening here, like the materials discussion. So we, we, we need to get to the detailed plans if we want to see action. Well, I want to thank each of you for the fantastic presentations, the broad-reaching discussion. Um, I think you've given everyone a lot to think about, far more to cover um, than we could possibly do in this hour and a half. Um, but I think it's a great set up for what we'll hopefully see in about a month. So um, we'll have everybody waiting on the edges of their seats for that, I think. So thank you again and appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.